The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Bruce at Bookmap, and welcome to the Bookmap Pro Trader webinar series. Uh, just uh, uh, make sure everyone can hear me. It looks like I'm broadcasting correctly, and you can see my, sc my screen correctly here. Yes. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, I need to go through the risk disclaimer first. Trading futures, equities, and digital currencies involves substantial risk of loss and is not suitable for all investors. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. Today we have Futures Trader 71, Morad Askar, a trader of 19 years. He started off as a SOS bandit trading high volume equities uh, back in the day. Uh, has since moved on to futures uh, for 16 years. Uh, in 2010, he opened his own prop trading firm. He's recognized as a pioneer in volume profile analysis, and he currently uh, is the head trader and director at Convergent Trading. So uh, let's go through some of his information here. I will put all of this into the chat for you, okay, as well as the recording. These are all recorded. Uh, and uh, I'll put the, uh, the YouTube link into the uh, um, chat for you as well. So uh, here's uh, FT71's information, uh, his website, Convergent Trading, his Twitter feed, at FuturesTrader71, uh, YouTube, uh, Convergent Trading, uh, and then also uh, FuturesTrader71 videos, uh, and his email, info at ConvergentTrading.com. There are some special offers you can get through uh, FT71 here. I'll put this link as well uh, into the uh, into the chat uh, if you're interested in uh, in Bookmap uh, with the special offers that are available through uh, FT71. Uh, and uh, just uh, get started. And let me just uh, turn it right over to uh, to FT. Thank you, sir. All right, just uh, one quick correction to what uh, Bruce was saying. I actually started my prop shop late 2003. I shut it down. I, I pared down the operation in 2010 as it became obvious that I needed to kind of expand what I was doing as opposed to, you know, scalping markets in a prop environment. Uh, so I let my traders, uh, the last trader go in 2010, and I started to focus on the online um, the the, pre, the online presence uh, that's where I gained my Twitter following and and all of that stuff just offering the best information I could. Anyway, uh, Bruce went through the uh, risk disclaimer which I'm required to provide. I appreciate that, Bruce. So today I'm going to talk about stocking a trade. And most people, when they look at uh, order flow, uh, generally are looking at um, just the order flow itself. But there's a lot more to it. So Bookmap is uh, is the tool I execute on. Been do doing so since they re started releasing, I think in 2014. Worked very very closely with the Bookmap team to uh, to build a lot of the features that that are in there to help kind of get it the way I like it, and hopefully other people do too. Uh, I use a product called CT Bookmap. Uh, it's a version of Bookmap, but it's got uh, some extra features in it. You can get it at ctbookmap.pro. Again, ctbookmap.pro. Here's what I'm covering today, and we're going to try to get through this as efficiently as possible. Everybody's here to trade, so I don't want to sit here and talk a long time. What I want to emphasize is this, what you have in front of you, is basically the holy grail uh, to trading. This is a summary of what I cover with convergence uh, traders on a day-to-day -day basis uh, along with other head traders in the head trader channel. And so preparation is like 90% of the work is done before the markets uh, are even open. Uh, preparation is key as it is in all endeavors, high performance endeavors in life. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's, you know, it's, um, you come in and you sit down and you really don't have a clue what key areas the market, you know, the bigger participants are watching, uh, where the market saw supply, where the market saw demand, uh, and so on, and think that you can kind of trade from the gut. Maybe some traders may be able to pull that off uh, using order flow, but I can tell you on a sustainable basis, meaning long-term trading, uh, organization of the information and creating an outline of the key reaction areas 
is key. So first, prep is key. Organize information to outline our plan for the day. I do this publicly every morning. You can watch this every morning. If you follow my Twitter feed, you can find me at twitter.com forward slash futurestrader71 or at futurestrader71. You'll see that every morning at 8 central, 9 eastern, I do a, a live broadcast at last sitting where between 15 uh, and if I'm rambling or covering some big things that happen that may go 25 minutes, that takes us right into the open. And I cover in it how things are kind of shaping up and what my expectations are, what my actions are likely to be uh, based on how the market responds. It's not a way to predict what the market will do or to set myself up for being kind of biased, um, but it is, it is a way to have a plan for whatever the market does. And sometimes the market does something completely different, in which case it means that I need to sit back or reassess. So outline the key reaction areas. Very, very important. Um, if you trade in the middle of nowhere just because you see something in the order flow, again, maybe that works for some people for scalping, but uh, I can tell you as someone who used to scalp about 3,000 to 3,200 sides a day, 1,600 round turns a day on average uh, in various futures product, uh, products, the DAX, uh, the Euro stocks, the S&Ps, mainly, I can tell you that uh, it's, a, it's a tough game. It's an expensive game to uh, focus on scalping alone. I would discourage anyone who trades online on a retail basis to do so. Next, you want to watch for how, where, or where the market opens and what it responds to. What kind of an open do we have? Uh, where are we opening relative to yesterday's auction? How are we doing versus the overnight? Uh, and the idea here is to, to figure out who is in control of the auction today, right? So today, uh, sellers were, you know, short time frame traders were in control. Early sellers stepped in. Uh, this is a trade that we talked about uh, this morning in Convergent Chat. I can give you a glimpse of that. And we set up the targets and stops and all that stuff. And then it it pushed right through and it went actually a lot farther than expected. It took out the overnight low um, as expected, although that given the open, I thought that would be a long shot for today. But um, we watch the auction and then we come up with a bias. Once we have a bias, in that moment, in whatever time frame we trade, different people have different time frames. But in the time frame I'm trading in, I'll create a bias, which may be very different than your bias, because you may be looking at 15-minute bars where I'm looking at a two-tick Renko and my time frame is between two and five minutes or something. So I form a bias in my time frame. The next thing I have to do is sit and wait. Um, sit and wait and and see what the market you know what the market does towards the areas we want to react in we will stock the trade in other words we will watch and kind of um, be a predator here and uh, stock the trade using book map using various features that I've talked about in the past uh, collisions liquidity being collided against how the collisions responded to things like that uh, the term collision is something that didn't exist before I started to talk about it uh, and then we trigger the trade, we control our risk, and then we let the trade play out however it wants. Once the trade is done, we log it. Make sure you log and journal your trades. If you're not, it's very, very hard to find problems and to become consistent. Your duty as a trader to yourself uh, and those of you support is to figure out what mistakes you're making and to eliminate mistakes. That's the, our main job. And then we repeat this entire process. That's how this works, okay? So let's look at today. Uh, let's look at today here for a minute. Let me close this. Today, let's look at the overall picture. A couple things to note. I have my dots filtered to 50. I don't wanna see anything smaller than that, really. Uh, so minimum trade size is 50 lots. Otherwise, it just gets a little bit too noisy for me. Um, I use the color spectrum and I'm using full depth here you are running the DX feed which is available through bookmap I think I think for for a fee initially I come in as I did this morning for the trader bite which took place here at 8 a.m all the times here shown here are Chicago times I'm right in the center of Chicago uh, so I 
came in and I saw that there's uh, quite a bit of liquidity in the 72, 73 area this morning, which is also a stock zone. You see how it says stock zone on the cloud notes. Uh, these cloud notes update automatically once I update them on the server. All of the uh, Convergence members uh, have these uh, and, and they just get updated as I update my levels throughout the day as necessary. Uh, you know, the, the 72 had some liquidity early on today. That was a key response area. Uh, the next area up is 77 where we're tangled right now above there, 80. 80, 81, 50 are really important areas above. And 53 where we bounced here, 53 had a lot of liquidity uh, available on the bid and you can see it on this chart. And this is the beauty of this product is look how far back I'm pulling. Even from yesterday, we see that there was liquidity here at 52.53, this is important. Uh, I couldn't see this before. When I was a high volume scalper, I wish I had this tool because it would have shown me who has been around for a while and offering for a while versus those who are just spoofing or flipping the book. But when I zoom in here, you could see that 53 uh, and a quarter or so had resting liquidity for the entire session. Also 51, 75, 52, those are important areas below from an order per, uh, flow perspective. Currently, uh, as, as we made this high here at 77, um, uh, at about 77, 76 or so, you can see that there's liquidity that's been resting here. One of the more important things I look at is how this liquidity acts as the market comes to it. So let's grab this for an example. So we see that as the color moves to the right of the spectrum up here, if you can see my pointer, actually, let me pull up my Epic pen. I know people can't see the go-to webinar tools very well. I have another tool that allows me to draw here. So as the, mar as the heat map moves in this direction, we have more and more depth. There's always some price that has red and then everything is colored um, accordingly, you know, on a relative basis. Uh, and so when, when the market starts to move up and there's the resting liquidity, what I want to see is I don't want it to see it go from darker, from red to white, to light blue, to dark blue, dark blue, dark blue, to black as the market moves up. I don't want to see that. What I want, what I want to see is it's, white, maybe light blue, turning yellow, turning darker yellow, turning orange, turning darker orange as we see here, and potentially red. And what this is saying is that there's an intent to have that level trade. Okay, so this size that's sitting here, the 512, they are uh, consistently increasing. So if we mouse over, if you look down here, if you look down here at the status line in a second, you could see that back here, we had 329, 329, 329, quite steady. And then it went to 342, a little higher, 342. Then it became 360. And then as we get closer and closer and closer, it starts to move towards 512 or so. Uh, it gets deeper and deeper. We wanna see that if this is, you know, for me, this particular level, this particular area is not really uh, something that I planned to trade in. Uh, so it doesn't, this liquidity doesn't fall into a stock zone area. Again, a stock zone is, is what we call, it's a registered trademark. And it describes uh, an area that we expect, we've identified as a, as a key reference area or a reaction area. Uh, and it's, I want, I want the liquidity, um, to align with a stock zone for me to respond. What I don't want to do is trade in the middle of nowhere uh, where I haven't pre-identified a potential uh, reaction area. Uh, then I'm basically becoming a scalper, a, probably a, a long-term, a low odds trader, and I don't want to be that. Uh, so as this kind of gets darker, as the market moves up, if I had some reference point here in the cloud notes column, I would then uh, be ready to stock the trade. 
Uh, my bias and, and everything that's involved in, in putting the trade together comes first. So my bias is really important. Coming up with a bias and a, and a plan for how we're going to attack the market is very important. So let me show you what happened this morning. First of all, I'm just going to show this. Uh, these are my charts. They may seem noisy. They're not. But essentially, this is where we open. This is yesterday's day session. This is the profile for yesterday. This is where we ended up. The profile, the volume profile, this, uh, this histogram that you see here that's uh, light gray and black, this volume histogram is simply showing us how much volume traded at each price. And what we know, what we're using here is we know that the highest volume price that traded yesterday, the entire day was a 29.6650. That's called the point of control. Um, that's called the point of control. It's the most traded volume of the session or the most accepted price. This is the market. This is where the market basically shows us uh, it's 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 uh, telling us that this is where it's accepting price the most for the session. We are opening up against yesterday's close or near yesterday's close. And the way this opened is it had an open auction, meaning it opened at a price, which was 20, uh, 29, uh, 29.69. That's the open, 29.69.75, this green line. And then it tested down to 29.68.50, tested up to 72.50, came back. And then it's basically an open auction because it's trading both sides of that line. What this means when there's an open auction, it means that it's likely that the um, the participant that's that's trading today, the participant that's in control, is likely to be a short time frame trader. Uh, the trick with a short time frame trader. Or the thing to know about a short time frame trader is generally a short time frame trader does not push directionally. In other words, a short time frame trader tends to be like us, uh, day trading or uh, just looking at short, uh, you know, short distance or short time frames for their trades. So, given the fact that the market opens. And, and, and has no real drive on the open. In other words, doesn't want to move away from here, either up or down. Now, I, I know that there's a high potential that I can fade a move going up. In other words, I can trade against a move going up into my first stock zone right here. Okay, and the action this morning, and I'll show you that on book map, the action this morning is such that it was lifting but is was doing so in a in a hesitant way. It was it was encountering a lot of uh, resistance, and so that set up a short, and the short target is is the most traded price. This is where volume profiling comes in. Um, this is where volume profile comes in, and you know the target is 29.6650, and it goes to 29.66 and a quarter. Beautiful. The next target is going to be the overnight point of control. This is most traded price overnight. This price is 29.6375, right? So this it's down here, and that's the next target. Where does it go? It goes to 29.63 and a quarter. So the, it took out the first target by one tick, it took out the second target right here by two ticks. So the first target, second target, and then from here it's gravy. Whatever it does from here. It does. The next area to work a, a, a scale out is two ticks ahead of the uh, uh, key reference area from rest yesterday, which is the low. Uh, so work 29.59. And then if uh, you have any runners, uh, then you just keep them on until the market reverses or whatever. And I consider a breach of this line, the mid uh, breach of this line as the potential end of the trend down or a slowdown of the trend down and it presents higher risk. So at this point, as it breaches the mid, this trade, if you have a trailer on or if you have, if we have a runner on, we want to close that trade at this point as it breaches above. Uh, this line here is a VWAP, but let's focus on what book map offered up to to create that trade. So what I showed you there is the prep part, 
okay? This is a really important part of the equation. That's the preparation outlining the key reaction area. That's the stock zone, the gray band that you see in my chart where we watch the market and how it opens. We can see that the short time frame trader is in control so we can go against that trader. They're generally a weaker hand. Um, and then we look for, look for something that supports our bias. In this case, it's short. And then this is where the order flow comes in. We pull up and we see that as the market moves up, as the market moves up, you can see that this offer from the open right here, this offer at 74 from the open is steady. It's been there a while, right? It's been sitting there through a good portion of the night. And as we approach that point, Watch what happens. It goes from orange to red to orange to red to maroon. It is essentially getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Now it's got my attention. Now I've got a trade set up and it's just a matter of how does it respond? Do we get a good collision in that area? Let me turn off the um, filter here so we can see everything. Now we come into this uh, collision area here and we can see that there's some size being lifted here. 402 traded. Uh, with a with a VWAP just under this price. So what happened here is in this area, somebody lifted that entire offer. I would not be able to see that without this tool. Once it lifts that entire offer, now I'm looking for sellers to come in. I'm looking for somebody to hit the bid. Somebody hit the bid at, for 273. That's not enough for me to trigger. Somebody comes along and bids a little bit more down here and they get completely taken out. Boom, trigger right here. So we're at 73.50, actually it was about around 73 and a quarter. And then we work our levels. We work our 66.50 down here, the VPOC right here. So this is where the cloud notes are really important. I don't need to look at my chart again. I'm targeting 66.50 and watch how it uh, approaches that. Oh, 66.50 moved, of course, with the scale. So you can see. It, it comes down to 66.50, touches it, and then takes it out. So now we've got risk off the table, and we can see that, uh, let me go back to filtering again, because there's a lot of noise here. I mean, it just gives you so much information. We could see that the, del the uh, volume delta, which is something that uh, uh, the guys at Bookmap put on here for me, the cumulative volume delta, we can see that the volume delta from the peak at 74 is just sliding downwards. What does this mean? That means there are more aggressive sellers than buyers, than there are buyers in terms of volume. There, there's more quantity hitting the bid. In other words, selling the market. They're the aggressor than there are buyers. And we see that the CVD is consistently dropping. This is good for the short. We want to stay put, not get shaken out of the trade. We don't care if it pops up as long as we are in this nice little trend. We want to see, uh, we want to hold. In addition, once it hit the 74, what we had on the way down this rotation here was approximately seven points or so, seven to nine points. That is technically what I call an impulse trade uh, or an initiating trade. It's an aggressive uh, it's an aggressive swing, and what generally happens with these aggressive swings is that they are likely to get a continuation. So as we push from 74 to 66 or so, it's about eight points, my expectation is for a continuation move to follow, so I'm going to hang on to this trade for a while. How do I, how do I, you know, the biggest issue I've seen, not only with my prop traders, but pretty much everybody that I've come across online since 2010. The issue is not, hey, I don't have a plan. I don't have an edge. That's usually what people think. But generally, people can follow their plan and can show that they have an edge in a simulator. And then they go live and it, everything is upside down. Their returns are upside down. Their wins are inverted versus their losses and stuff. And then now we have a psychological problem. And the, psych, the way to beat uh, one of the ways to beat the psychological problem is to just plan things out ahead of time. Uh, we are basically fighter pilots, right? So a fighter pilot doesn't just say, 
hey, let me get in the cockpit, take off, and then acquire my targets, and then figure out my flight plan and my waypoints into that flight plan to avoid enemy radar and, and enemy anti-aircraft guns and things like that. No, they set a plan out, but the pilot is not going to take off and fly into enemy territory and follow that plan. Doesn't matter who's shooting at them. Doesn't matter what the environment, how the environment may have changed. That's not how it works, but they still go out there with a plan. And that's what I show in terms of the scenarios and what my expectations are for the market or how the market may play out. It's just a plan. And that's what keeps me in the trade. So I know that if it gets below the point of control and it takes out the overnight point of control, it is likely to keep pressing the short side until it gets to yesterday's value area low. Where does it respond? Take a look at this. It responds, see this here? 58.75 value area low. And yesterday's low a day, we have some confluence here. I expect a response and you see that there's a, a quick burst up. At the bottom of the screen here, you see a quick burst up in buying. That's expected. This little burst, if you're watching in book map and watching every tick, you would likely get pushed up. Most people cannot hold on through this little burst. Oh my God, they're lifting, it's done. No, this is an expected reaction area. I'm still gonna hold on unless the mid gets taken out. I'm gonna, I need to cough, hang on one second. Does everybody follow what I'm doing here so far? Cause I'm, you might be drinking out of a fire hose. Uh, I know this material very well and, and how I trade. I've been trading like this since about 2000, 2008, 2009. Um, I know it's a lot to process, but just hang in there. The most important part when it comes to order flow is not that, hey, I can find a trade. So let's go to the current order flow. This is, this is live right now. And the way this is set up is I'm monitoring the ES chart, but I recommend that everybody trade the micros. I've pushed for the micro since 2012. I've worked closely with the CME, uh, which is about a block away from my office here. I've worked very closely with them to push this micro product out to de-lever uh, the futures contract. My recommendation, one of the features that you have here in Bookmap is this cross instrument trading, very, very useful. So I did a webinar for another partner, Futures IO, um, back uh, in April before the launch of the micros. And I recommended a trading plan consisting of three contracts, which represents uh, 30% of one ES contract. And I recommended, you know, an all in scale out, scale in, scale out, whatever, whichever suits you, but trade three contracts in the micros. And you can set this right up in your book map. But because the micros don't have, see how the micros liquidity is kind of weird. It doesn't have the same quality of liquidity as uh, as the ES, uh, there's not as much volume, although it's done incredibly well. Uh, the, the product itself has a very tight spread, so I don't need to worry about poor fills or whatever. So what I do is, you know, what I would recommend you do is to follow the ES, trade off of the ES while sending your orders to the micro ES. I don't know if any of any other product that does this, this is very helpful. So, uh, my point was, I can find trades in here all day, every day. Oh, look, there's this liquidity, the market's dropping, it's turning from dark, from black, to dark blue, to light blue, to white, to yellow, to orange, and may even turn darker. So I may wanna lean against this 29.73. Unless I take stock of what's happened before it, what the context is and what my plan is, I am simply kidding myself by taking uh, you know, taking trades in whatever area. I'm still only interested in trading according to my plan. People, do not trade outside of your plan. If you trade outside of your plan, you are paying the professional traders. That's all you're doing. You're just making a donation into somebody's pocket who does have a plan, who doesn't need your money, but is happy to go spend it on a new Armani suit or whatever, you know? Just don't do it. So. As the market pulls back into the IB, into the stock zone, we can see that on our charts, 
we've had an impulse up, we've had a continuation, the impulse ended at 76.75, we've had a, a continuation trade at 77.50, we have a, a relatively weak high, the market is really struggling to push through the 77.50, but is not moving away quickly. Uh, this may be a small scalp right here, uh, a small scalp opportunity against the liquidity that's here. As long as that liquidity sticks around, I may, if I don't have a trade here, uh, but I, I may just continue to stock it to see what's the quality of the lifting, right? I could see that there was a collision right up here. There's heavy liquidity, relatively heavy liquidity, and a big print. So there's a small collision, and then the market tried to push above, tried to push above again, and it couldn't. What this may mean is that the market's likely to rotate down. The auction is likely to rotate down. Why? to find those buyers. So its job is to go advertise price as low as it needs to go in order to find buyers. I don't really have a trade here. We're too close to the high for me to, to take a long here. Uh, it could drop a little more. So there may not be, in a, I fully intended to take a live trade and, and the way that I suggest you do which is a three lot on the micros cross instrument trading between the ES and the micro ES and to, to find a, find a trade through this uh, during this session and, and to, to show you how to put it on, how to, you know, how to stock it, what to look for uh, and how to scale out and control risk and all that good stuff. But we're in a situation here where we are past the European close. Things are likely to slow down and go into balance. You can see we're building a fair amount of, fair amount of uh, volume in this area. The market is balancing out here and it may come down and test a little bit further down. This, this area here, the 7071 is, uh, is likely to be tested and that may create an opportunity down there if liquidity comes in as we're going down. As, uh, as we're going down, we're looking to see if this 69 or other areas start to kind of brighten up um, on the heat map as we approach. That would set me up for a potential long scale out at the IB high and then work an order immediately ahead of the, the double top 77.50. So I'd work 77, looking for a break of this week high and a move towards 79. So see how it's kind of moving and chewing through that size that was there. It, again, it's too close to the high and the time of day is not great. Um, it's not all that great to uh, to um, for a continuation trade. Anyway, it doesn't look like I'm going to get an opportunity here. But uh, are there any questions at this point about what I've covered so far? Uh, <clears throat> just taking a look here. Um, nothing too much. Um, I put the uh, video in the chat there for uh, anyone interested in that cross uh, pairs instrument uh, trading. Um, uh, how do we get the ULR uh, for cloud notes? Oh, the URL. Um, the cloud notes URL is proprietary. It's confidential for convergent members only. This is my homework and, uh, and, and other people's homework that we share with anybody that has Bookmap. In fact, we've got this adopted to various charting packages as well. Uh, you, can, you can pull these cloud notes into your Sierra charts so you have these bands that you see the cloud notes re reflect the levels that you see on this chart here. So this gray band is the same <clears throat> is the same as the gray band you see right here, an eight tick stock zone. Uh, those are all proprietary to um, to convergent members at the moment. This is what people are subscribing for or part of it. I'll cover what convergent offers uh, before we leave. Okay, yeah, some questions about that. And then uh, I put the links, all the links in there uh, for everybody so that uh, you can, uh, uh, for more information about uh, conversion trading, et cetera, it's all in there, okay? Uh, okay. Let's see, uh, questions on uh, some of the uh, order management here. Um, and uh, just a moment here. Uh, how do you manage your stops uh, knowing when you are wrong? Okay, <clears throat> so, um... I'm probably getting into too much detail. Let's move to the DX feed just so we get more accurate. So let's imagine, okay, first of all, the reason this long against this liquidity here is not something I'm interested in 
One of the reasons is because one of the biggest rules I have for when I take a trade is how far my stop has to be. And the, the rule of thumb is, and for those who've been following since I came online in 2008 or whatever, I always want to have my stop beyond an area where the market has to work hard in order to take my stop out. For example, uh, if let's say, let's say the market moves down here, okay, to this area down here. And I have some sort of a setup long, hypothetically. Okay, and I'm looking to take a setup long for a bounce. I know that this area here probably represents some consolidation volume based on the zipper. I call these zippers because as the market does this, right, it consolidates, volume comes in. Generally, there's a fair amount of volume that goes on. It kind of looks like a zipper, like on your jacket or pants or whatever. Um, I am going to rely on this volume here uh, to protect my long position against the edge of the volume. Not a very good example, but that's that's one of the things I need. If I had taken a trade up here where the liquidity was on the pullback because I want to target this double top uh, and the overnight high, my stop kind of doesn't, I don't have anything here. I, in this whole area shows an impulse. This is an impulse. There's nothing here for me to lean against and the market can zip down very easily. Now, every trade has a 50-50 chance. Every single trade has a 50-50 chance. It doesn't matter if you're an algorithm, if you're a genius, if you have a 99% winning plan, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. It's still a 50-50 chance. Now I know that, but I want my 50-50 chance uh, that the market's gonna take out my stop. I want it to have to eat through a lot of volume right here. I want it to work hard to hit my stop, which would be on the other side of this. If I don't have a defined stop area, so see how this is pulled back to that liquidity and is working. Um, again, 50-50 chance. Uh, if, if, um, if I don't, you know, if I, if I take a trade in the middle of nowhere and the market just easily kind of takes it out because there was an impulse there and there's not much liquidity in that area, let me pull up. A, so if we look at, yeah, this isn't a very good area. It doesn't have much volume in it at all. Um, it's just much easier for it to fall through and hit my stop. If I don't have a stop area though, I use right now, based on the current volatility, I use a three and a half point fixed stop initially. I wanna use a structural stop as much as possible. In other words, lean on the order flow, lean on zippers, lean on volume areas. But if I don't have that, then I'm I'm looking like this morning's uh, setup uh, off of 74 to 73 and a quarter short. That is a fixed stop. That's three and a half points that I'm willing to give up in order to discover, to 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 see the market move, you know, eight points in the other direction and beyond, which it did this morning. And you know, that's a predefined stop if I have nothing else. But in general, I want to lean against something. And in order to control risk, so let me show you what happened this morning with the short. Here's a great example. So the short was, pull up my pen. Let me choose a kind of a nicer color, I guess. The short was 73 and a quarter right here. Stop is three and a half points up, somewhere up there. And then the market pulls back, okay, consolidates. This is what I call a zipper. This is a zipper right here. Okay, this is a small consolidation and it had some volume behind it. This is a good area to control risk. So as the market moves down towards my target, the point of control initially, remember it went through and touched it and then went through it right down here. As I'm controlling risk, I'm actually moving my stop from three and a half points up here to just behind this area. Why? Because if the market decides to bounce, 
it is much more likely to consolidate here in the zipper, tangle with this volume here before it breaks through. It is rare that you have a market zipper with volume that the market just goes down and just rips through. I want the market to give me plenty of warning before it takes out my stop, right? So this is, uh, this is how it control risk. So it starts to move towards the point of control. And all I'm doing at this point is looking for the next zipper lower. So as it starts to continue lower, I start to see, okay, where's the next zipper? Nothing very good structurally here, but I can see there's some volume. This is the chart volume profile. So I can see there's some volume here. So now my stop moves to there. My stop moves right here, just above this volume here. So I'm using this whole area as a zipper. That's how I trail. As the market moves lower, market breaks down, moves lower. I can see that there's some volume here. This becomes the next area. So my stop starts to move down here. So I don't have a fixed trailing stop like algorithms do or like other people recommend. I mean, if to me, if it's in a book, you don't want to, you don't want to use it to be honest with you. But so that last area right here, stop area, so the stop would be here, would have triggered right in there. The mid was around here and then the market took off. I expect that the market should not, or my expectation is that the market would not just rip right through that area and just keep going and take me out. I expected the struggle here a little bit, burst, and then go sideways, pull back, go sideways, and then start to move up. And it forms a new zipper. So if I was long, I would wanna be under this zipper, right? And so on and so forth. So if, if we're looking to the long side, I'm constantly checking for, and, and Bookmap shows these very well. I'm constantly checking, let's say I got long. Well, my stop will be on the other side of this zipper. Boom, gets long, comes back to the middle of the zipper right here, tries again, lower high, warning, this is where you start to get warnings. Hey, this is a lower high. There's not much effort here. We're being offered a little lower collision holding, likely to take us out. Boom, it takes us out, right? So that's how I control risk in general. Anything else, Bruce? Okay, uh, yes. Um, so uh, just uh, answering a few questions here. Uh, Let's see. Um, well, uh, a question about uh, using DX feed versus rhythmic. Um, and if uh, you've uh, taken a look maybe uh, at the differences or have any insight uh, on that. I, I've heard different things. I don't have rhythmic. In fact, I will have rhythmic. I'm re removing everything that's gain related. Uh, the data from gain is, has been quite poor, to be honest with you. Uh, lots of, lots of, um, Lots of downtime, lots of lag. Uh, it's it was been, it's been good for the last seven years, but it just seems like it's not keeping up for some for some reason. I'm sure they'll fix it, but uh, rhythmic to me is probably the top um, feed that I would use. Um, you know, for those of you who need uh, who need a broker that uh, that uh, offers rhythmic, you, I'm happy to to try to help you out. You can reach me on Twitter, as I said, or at convergent convergentrading.com forward slash contact, and I'll try to put you on in touch with someone. Um, a little complicated right now, but I, I, you know, I would say that rhythmic is probably a higher lower a higher quality package, um, and and that's and it's full depth. Uh, it's they really emphasize the quality of their of their of their data, and they are constantly upgrading, updating, building out. Uh, pretty much every Friday they send notice for maintenance after the close. Uh, I've met the CEO, fantastic guy, uh, very focused on the quality of their feed. That's where I would go before I went. I would go with DX Feed. It does have history as well, I believe. Uh, but in terms of, uh, you know, you can get rhythmic and trade on it as well as get the data versus DX feed where you have to have a trading feed and then pay DX feed separately to get the full depth data. Okay. Um, I'm not a huge fan of uh, uh, CQG either. Uh, I think rhythmic is a better quality product uh, overall, to be honest with you. For this, for this application, to be able to see the depth 
you know, let's look at how far I can go to see what's out there. You know, way, way out. I can see that there's size being offered at 3016 still. Look at the size being offered way up here. Look at my gain feed, which only gets, goes 10 deep. I can't see beyond 10 deep. If, if it didn't trade there today, it's just a black hole. Let's go to 3016. Nothing. It's just a black hole. That's all I get. Whereas with DX feed, I get everything. Uh, and the same goes for rhythmic. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. Frank is asking here about uh, setting your uh, stop loss. Maybe let's say, for example, three to four points. Uh, would you only enter a trade uh, if you uh, have a fixed risk reward uh, or uh, this is moving a little too quickly here. Um, or are you just focused on what the market is willing to give you? Uh, the trade has to be sized so that I have a better than one R, uh, one risk factor, one R factor, or one risk reward. Uh, I don't like saying risk reward. I just use R factors. So a 1.25 R factor means I'm, I have the potential to gain 1.25 times my risk. You want to keep that at about 1.25 or better. Um, I did a webinar on risk control and, and, and went through the statistics and the numbers uh, for convergent members. Uh, if you're in convergent, you can find it in the recent um, webinar archive. It's really, really important to go see that. The way an equity curve changes, it's very, very dramatic when you get above one R or one-to-one -one risk. So if a trade does not present an opportunity to provide me with at least five points or so uh, at net, right? Because I scale out, it's not worth taking. It's not worth me risking a stop out for three and a half points on my full lot, uh, my full unit, if I'm only going to gain four points at best. Uh, it's just isn't, it's not good business. It's not good business. It's kind of like um, being a supermarket and buying bread for from a wholesaler, a bakery for $2 and then offering it for $2.10. Well, you'd have to sell a whole lot of it perfectly uh, and none of it can be disposed of a rot uh, before you sell it for you to make any money and the money you make isn't even covering your costs. Uh, so really you have to see the, the, the your trading as a business and you don't wanna be trading, You know, most scalpers will do one R, some scalpers will do 0.75 R or less but I, I'm going to tell you, if you run that out for 2,000, 3,000 trading samples, uh, the expectancy is negative there in the long run. Okay. Uh, Charles is asking here if you can contrast uh, using bookmap in trending or initiated markets versus responsive. Seems like your plan is geared more uh, toward responsive markets. Uh, no, uh, it, it, you're, you're, that's a good observation. However, it's not, that's not correct. I don't trade breakouts, so I do not see, I don't go here and see that the market just ripped up and just buy, uh, but I'm trading with the trend. I'm constantly looking for who's in control. So right here in this impulse up, this isn't a short time fr uh, frame participant or many in control. This is an initiative move. This is an, this is an impulse. I want to trade the direction of the impulse, but I'll trade the pullback. So for people watching, when I zoom in, it almost, it almost always seems like I'm trading against the immediate short-term trend. But remember, the market operates in fractals, right? For you, um, you know, what you see in a one-minute chart may be the exact opposite of what I see in a five-minute chart, which may be the exact opposite of some, what someone can see in a 15-minute chart, which is probably noise for someone looking at a 16 minute chart, right? So first you have to define what time frame are you trading in? What time frame is this person you're listening to or debating your trades with? What is their time frame? Because you could find yourselves ar arguing about uh, opposing points, but you may both be right or wrong. But here, if I'm, I see an impulse, I want to get long, but I'm not going to take a long on a breakout. I just don't trade that way. So what I have to do is find a good point to fade the pullback. So it always seems like I'm always trading kind of against the trend. But if I wanted to get long this push, I'm looking to trade the 72 area, potentially 71. That area would be the area. So in that case, 
I see the market, you'll see the market moving against me. And it always seems like I'm, I'm mean reverting. I'm not mean reverting in this situation. I'm buying with the trend because I will not trade a breakout. I'm not going to put a buy stop up here above the size and get triggered and look to, to ride this. Why? Because the way I trade, that would put me way too far for my risk, way too far. Um, and so I'm always fading something. In the, in the trading world, fading, the word fading means going against what seems to be the trend or the direction of the market. But I'm actually going uh, with the overall uh, the overall flow, the overall trend in my time frame, which is a, an intraday time frame. So I'm going to take a short when I see the market falling, but I'm not going to just short a break down. I'm going to fade a pullback. Let's say the short this morning at 74, which was just a beautiful entry, um, a beautiful setup. If I didn't catch this, I'm going to look for a pullback to this collision zone. I'm going to look to 72-ish, 71-ish for the next short. Okay, I missed that short. Look for a pullback to 69-ish to, to this consolidation. But I'm still trading with the trend. So a trend day, non-trend day, it doesn't matter. I'm going to trade it the same way. I'm still in, in terms of triggering on the, my execution platform, which is CT Bookmap. But overall, I'm constantly assessing and reassessing who's in control, um, who's in control, how, you know, how is the market facilitating trade? Is it easier for the market to move down versus up? That sort of thing. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Uh, Kyle is asking here, uh, and there's a few questions about this. So, uh, uh, how do you trade the, um, when the daily, uh, presidential tweets or, uh, this geopolitical news, uh, really, um, uh, makes it, uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, volatile, uh, uh condition. Yeah, it's it's unpredictable. So if I sat here and said, I love surprise, unscheduled geopolitical news, uh, I would be lying to you. I do love the volatility it creates. So if I'm not in a trade, which I'm more often than not, not in a trade, I'm not someone who's constantly in the market. I just don't see a benefit to that. What geopolitical news does is it creates a condition that gives us volatility. Volatility is money, and it's money that's gained or lost. Higher volatility means higher opportunity, a greater opportunity to make money or a greater opportunity to lost. I welcome the opportunity to have that volatility. And in general, these geopolitical events unfold just like everything else. Let's look at the overnight session. A little bit of news, I think, last night. Where was it? And what you'll see is like a pretty dead session until all of a sudden something happens, right? So you got you got this really dead kind of Europe opens. We pull back a little bit. Uh, we sell off a little bit. So Europe opened at 2 a.m. my time right in here. This is the European open right here. You can see a jump in, uh, in volume. The European treasury open right here, you can see a jump in volume. But it kind of chugs along, you know, and it just kind of goes sideways for a while, right? And then something happens. News. See this volume down below? Volume right here. Bruce, is it easy to see this hand cursor, or am I kind of pointing at stuff and people aren't? No, seeing? it's it's very clear on on my end here. Okay, um, so you could what this does is it says, hey, there's some there's something going on here. I may not know what it is. I have a good news feed, but I may not know what this is. But expect a pullback opportunity for a continuation down because the impulse is down on volume, right? And there it is. It, that's all it does. So the geopolitical news may pepper in opportunities, impulse continuation opportunities, uh, just you know, to, throughout the day. Here's an impulse. There's the con continuation, right? So this is this is the impulse. This is a continuation right here. And then we, we keep trying to take that out. We're not able to. The market is very very likely to start moving towards. 66 ish, 68, 66 going forward here. That's basically what it's projecting. 
Uh, but trying to trade the news itself, like, oh my God, Trump said such. And it's not, the computers are reading that news. There's so much trading that happens before it even gets out. Who knows who's saying what to whom from the White House to some hedge fund, who knows? But we see you can, you can go right down to like the millisecond in this platform and see large trades go off before the news even hits you know, in the correct direction very, very often. I'm not going to compete with those guys. Hope that answers your question. Yep. Okay. Um, I, actually, uh, there's lots of questions here, um, uh, and um, I don't think we'll get have time to go through all of them. Uh, you know, I can reach out to you guys. Uh, there's a lot of here about the platform. You can uh, reach out to support at bookmap.com. Uh, we can uh, answer those questions for you. Uh, and then uh, you also have, I've been putting the links in here. These will answer a lot of the questions coming in. I just pasted it again into the chat there. You'll find all sorts of information there about the recording, uh, FT's uh, uh, email, etc. cetera. Uh, you can email us at support at bookmap.com, et cetera. Uh, FT, I, actually, I, I have a question for you regarding your pullbacks. Um, and uh, are you um, uh, placing a limit uh, order in those areas and are, are there are there specific areas you're looking for in terms of like volume clusters uh, where the likelihood of that pullback pullback and getting filled is more uh, probable because a lot of times there's there's very I mean there are typically very low volume pullbacks uh, so I'm that, wondering where true. you're getting you know how, how are you managing your your entries on those I don't actually trade. The only time I use a limit order is to manage my exits, my scale outs. I actually don't have resting orders. Um, I, you know, I'm on a six millisecond line to the exchange and I, I, I don't, I don't feel like I would miss an opportunity if I saw one. I prefer to hit the market, to hit the bid, to get short or lift the offer to get long versus putting, guessing at where the market, you know, I would have to be very, very precise to guess at where the market is likely to fill me versus not, or where the market might run through me uh, versus not. Uh, so I, I don't want to put all that pressure on myself to be accurate. So what I do is I look at the order flow as it approaches and I simply hit the bid once, you know, I see that there's, there's, there's uh, uh, the market's having a difficult time uh, kind of uh, getting through an area. For example, uh, I will, you know, I, I use that with a footprint right here to tally up how the market's performing and, and which kind of type of participant. This table down here tells me what kind of a participant is, is uh, performing in that area. You can see that uh, in general, the delta, this, this, uh, this right here, I won't get into this too much, but the market's having a hard time committing here. This is measuring the delta on these last bars, these last few bars. You can see that it's really having a hard time committing one way or the other. Uh, not a very good time to be uh, trading, really. Uh, so I'm, I'm likely to stay away from that area. I, I use this as a kind of a point of reference to see what's happening inside, but if you're using bookmap, what you'll notice is that, you know, it lifts, 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 and it upticks. It lifts and upticks, lifts and upticks. But if it's lifting, 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 and it's not going anywhere, especially if size is going off, you see these big bars at the bottom kind of printing right down here. You see these big bars, but it's not really lifting or going anywhere. It's likely that either the market is, has gone into balance and is dormant and you shouldn't be trading or it's exhausted its ability to buy and move price. If it's, it's a tug of war, if it's exhausted its ability to, to move price, then you know what's gonna happen, what's likely to happen is that everybody who's long and is weak and is kind of insecure is likely to become a seller. So I wanna sell to those people. Uh, there was a perfect example of this actually on Monday where the market had an iceberg at the low and it just kept hitting and hitting and hitting and hitting and hitting and it's hitting in zero space, uh, this black. There's nothing on the bid here. And it's hitting and hitting and hitting with size. So that tells me there's a hidden iceberg there that's buying and buying and buying and buying. Well, if it continues to do that, like imagine you were short because you, you know, 
you're, you're looking for the market to drop, you're short, and it goes into this area, let's, uh, let's say it's 74, and you see this size going off, like 50 lots, 100 lots, 50, 20, 20, 50, 70, 100, 120, 70, 60, 50, like, and it's just cannot get below this, it's almost like a lock limit down market, um, and it's not able to go below that, even if you're short from above, you're going to become a buyer. And then what you see is it, it just exhausts the sellers because that iceberg just wants to get filled. And then, boom, it explodes to the upside and it creates a, a very great opportunity. And we can see that. We can detect it uh, within this heat map. We can look back in time versus something that refreshes the dome like some other platforms or it just refreshes the dome or gives you a reconstructed tape or whatever. It doesn't show me that because I can't, I don't have the memory capacity to kind of keep track of where this stuff happened on a tick to tick basis. But I can see that it's trying at a level, keeps hammering, hammering, hammering. It's not able to move, but I don't put a bid out. I'm not going to put a limit out there because if I put a limit out, and it doesn't get filled, and that happens to be the 10 point move. Well, I was what I call a dick for a tick. Sorry, it's just something we use a lot in prop trading. You just gave up a lot of upside on a trade that you've set up and have a bias and a plan for and defined risk because you wanted it a tick better at a limit order and there was just too much liquidity there to fill you. No, I don't want that. I, can, I see in front of me that something says that this thing just can't go down. I'm gonna lift, I'm gonna lift and fine, I may pay up a tick or two higher than somebody who's a limit order below me and I may get filled and they get filled better, but it doesn't matter. My job is to be in the trade, manage my risk, define risk, get a better risk reward and do that 10, 20, 30, 100,000 times in my career. That's how I'm gonna make money. This very next trade that happened not to work is irrelevant. I don't wanna miss it because I put in all this effort to determine my bias, to determine the trade, to wait for the market to come to my area. And now I'm going to sit here and demand a better price by, by using a limit order. No, it's not going to be that way. For my exits, I'll immediately, as soon as I get filled, so as soon as I get filled, let's say I'm trading here, as soon as I get filled or even before it, if I can, you know, if I can identify the areas like in this situation that high at 77 and a half, I'd be working 77. So I'll come out here and I'll work 77s right here. I'll put my orders out, even though the market's dropping just so I can get queued. But when it's time to lift, I just lift the market and let it go. Here's the break higher that I was talking about earlier. Um, so it's able to, it moved down low enough to, to find those prices. As I said, 71-ish is the area that I was targeting to, to start moving up. Anyway, I think we're over our time, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's been there's tons of questions in here, guys. A, a lot of the links that I've put into the chat there are going to answer uh, your questions. Uh, if you can uh, uh, get access to the chat box there and go to webinar. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm sorry, we can't get to all your questions. Uh, you know, you can email us at, at support at bookmap.com or uh, FT71's uh, email, uh, info at um, convergenttrading. Uh, dot com. Yeah, convergentrading.com is there as well. Uh, so you can reach out uh, uh, that way. Uh, it, and uh, yeah, anything else that you'd like to go over? No, that's it. I want to, you know, let everybody know that we're building a community here. We've been at this for a year and a half and there's a lot that we're covering. This is the sort of stuff we talk about all day long. I mean, essentially, uh, we have a channel with head traders. Nobody else can post in that channel to keep the noise down. A select group of people are able to post in there, and the goal is to have a the same as a you know a prop a physical prop environment, uh, but online, and people can be a part of it. Uh, we you know we we've kept costs down, we keep a low barrier to entry, but the goal is to ha to build this community, and that community is called ConvergentTrading.com. Soon we'll be introducing technology, some technology solutions, and things like that, uh, so that people can see these things better or trade the market a little more clearly uh, with less concern over technology rather than, you know, focus on the market. I find people fiddle a lot with their technology solutions. We do have these stat sheets, very, very important. I mean, if you don't look at the market statistically, boy, you're, you're, uh, I believe you're at a disadvantage. 
Uh, so we release these stats uh, on, on various products, quite a few products. We keep them up, up to date. I trade a lot statistically. Um, I, I've talked a lot of stati uh, about statistics in the past on Twitter, the overnight uh, stat, the IB stat, the overnight point of control stat, and so on and so forth. Uh, you also get Trade the News, which normally costs $185 per month. It is included in the membership. It's a very, very high quality news feed. And if you, you know, since 2008, if you haven't been, uh, uh, if you don't have a news feed, I believe that uh, it puts, uh, puts traders at a disadvantage. Again, this is $185 per month included in our membership. We do have our live commentary, but we only comment when there is something to comment about. And of course, the stock zones, the URL for the stock zones, and that's for Bookmap, IRT, Sierra, Ninja, all of those are done all the time. And then twice a week, we meet one for a study hall where we might do statistics together or go over a trade, a live trade uh, or so on. Those are on Thursdays and then every Tuesday at noon central, one Eastern, we have a trade talk where we take AMA questions, address a particular issue for a trader or discuss what's going on in the market uh, and so on and so forth. I'm basically taking what I did for prop uh, if in my prop shop for, seven, eight years and making it available to everybody because everybody wants to have a you know, prop trade. Well, you, you can have all the tools and everything else uh, without having to move to Chicago to be able to be a part of that. Uh, so anyway, I know that sounds like a pitch or whatever, but I, I do want to build this community. Uh, it's very, very important to me. It's where my attention is. This is where I believe I can make the most difference for traders. Thanks for having me on. Uh, excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Morad. Uh, just a fan fantastic uh, presentation here. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. The uh, uh, webinar uh, will be, it's recorded, it will be posted on our YouTube channel. I put the link in there uh, in the chat. Uh, look for it in about uh, two and a half hours or so uh, once we get everything up. Okay. Thanks again, FT. Uh, much appreciated. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me on.